you for everything. After these introductory words about the context of Enlight, uh, I'm really happy to welcome you here to this webinar. Uh, this is also in coordination, uh, well, not really planned, but uh, it seemed very uh, well coordinated in order to the Swedish presidency of the Council of the European Union, where there a few weeks ago was a meeting with the ministers responsible for higher education, research and innovation. And they were also talking about this um, area of uh, research data, research infrastructure, how to make use of these uh, enormous efforts with a lot of funding put into different structures and uh, uh, resources uh, in order to make impact in society. Uh, we have an interesting set of speakers here today and also a very interesting and nice uh, mix of participants uh, who have signed up for this seminar. Uh, if you're not able to stay for look for all the speakers, there will also be a recording so you can come back in here and look for things afterwards. Uh, among the people who have signed up, uh, we have from students, we have research data management people, we have researchers, we have people from the policy making area. Uh, and uh, that's uh, really good because this is an area attracting a lot of interest and also some people are consider it uh, technical, maybe difficult to understand, uh, but important uh, and there is a really uh, um, urge for practical examples and uh, good uh, things to be inspired of. And our speakers today are, of course, a mix of different uh, kind of uh, persons. We have those who have worked with the European Science Cloud in order to actually make data available. Uh, we have the COVID-19 platform, for instance, uh, which really make it apparent that such an investment and in infrastructure is paying off. Uh, in the, only a few years, they managed to set up a pilot or, well, docked into the European Open Science Cloud and they collect clinical and genomic data. Now they are moving on to also make surveillance over other kinds of uh, pathogens and pandemics, which is, of course, of great societal interest. Uh, many of the research infrastructures are also leaders in the data-driven science that are at the forefront of establishing a good community practice in relation to fair and open data. And universities play a major role in data generation, storage, and curation. So they often channel the scientific productivity of their researchers. And that will be a very important step in order to make use of data in society. Um, when speaking about the program today, there will, of course, be a short break uh, later on. We will listen to two interesting speakers. Uh, and uh, there are, of course, an opening to post questions. Uh, we listen to the speakers, and then at the end, there will be an opportunity to ask questions. And if you would like to do that, you raise your hand. You can also write in the chat. We have Merle Schatz from Göttingen, who will uh, have a uh, well, look at the chat and uh, make sure that questions uh, will. Uh, also be taken care of. Is there any immediate things that you would like to know before we start the immediate program? No. Uh, then I can see that our first speaker, Sally Chambers from Ghent University, is really on her up on her toes. She's the Digital Humanities Research Coordinator at the Ghent Center for Digital Humanities. Uh, and she has really a vast experience in making data available uh, in the digital humanities area. 
she's also coordinator of the Belgian participation of DARIA, which is the Digital Research Infrastructure for Arts and Humanities and member of the board of directors. Uh, the goal of the DARIA in the Belgium uh, perspective, well, Sally is of course uh, uh, really a really central person is to offer a sustainable portfolio of services to support digital research in art and humanities. Welcome, Sally. This Thank you. Yours. Thank you very much, Margarita and Merle, for the invitation. I hope I can live up to all those nice things that you've just said. So let's see how we go. There we go. Just start the screen sharing. Yeah. So hopefully you'll be able to see my slides in one second. So um, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, I'd like to take a few minutes this morning to talk to you a little bit about the opportunities um, the challenges and the lessons learned from the integration process, very much from the DARIA perspective. So many of you in the room will probably know DARIA but that's, if not, it's the Digital Research Infrastructure for the Arts and Humanities. So it's one of the S3 infrastructures. And in the pre-discussion, we are working with uh, the European Open Science Cloud of EOSC. And I want to further complicate things a little um, by bringing in cultural heritage data and some of the initiatives related to data infrastructure related to that as well. So um, I want to take you from, as Margarita said, I'm based at the Ghent Centre for Digital Humanities, and uh, that is the National Coordinating Institution for DARIA in Belgium, and take you right down from the sort of coal face all the way up um, into the EOSC ecosystem. Um, so it may be a bit of a whistle stop tour and um, all of the jigsaw puzzles uh, pieces may not fall into place, but I will try and sort of give you an overview from the institutional to the European perspective and everything in between. So um, let's start. So this is um, a, a snapshot from the, the Ghent Centre for Digital Humanities um, website. Um, or against CDH as it's known. So we focus on uh, four particular areas. So digital heritage, and that relates to the digital collections, also virtual exhibitions and participatory research and moving out towards citizen science. Then geospatial analysis, so that is really looking at geospatial data management and visualization of particularly historical data or on maps and so forth. Digital text analysis, so for example, if we have digital um, heritage collections, such as digitized newspapers, we can use digital um, text analysis tools and qualitative data analysis tools to uh, analyze this research data. And of course, um, we all need to be able to uh, curate that data. So we have collaborative databases enabled to do that. So we have, it's sort of like, a shared version of Excel or access to be able to work in research teams to be able to link that data or also do analysis on top of that data. So, so like, for example, social network analysis. So if we're thinking of this in the research infrastructure perspective, um, we are one particular center at Ghent University. And um, we um, provide various services to our local um, local uh, research community. So if we start from that perspective. So then I sort of jump to where we are within Belgium. Um, so here we have an example of um, the Flemish um, research infrastructure roadmap. So um, as some of you may know that uh, Belgium is quite a complicated country and how uh, research is, infrastructure is funded. Um, so in Ghent University, we uh, get our um, research infrastructure funding from the FWO or the Flemish Research uh, Organization. So here, if you can see at the top, top left-hand corner, we have the Ghent Center for Digital Humanities that I've just talked about, but we also have other 
digital humanities uh, research centres spread across Belgium. But here I'll talk a little bit more about the Flemish ones. So one in Antwerp and where they're doing a lot of work to do with digital scholarly editions. We have um, the one in Brussels at the uh, VUB. Um, where they're doing a lot of, to do with, for example, uh, social and economic history, or at Leuven, uh, Digital Humanities, where they have an advanced master in digital humanities. So you can see that this is part of a larger ecosystem. But just looking in a little bit more detail at Ghent, and I think Philippe uh, is in, in the, the room as well, um, who is responsible for core facilities. So if we're thinking of Gen CDH as a uh, research, uh, a node in uh, a larger, either national or European research infrastructure, it's really important that we have a solid foundation. So uh, I've heard this so many times that uh, sustainable re research infrastructures are funded by short term staff, uh, which is a, a weird um, challenge or lesson learned maybe. But at Ghent University, they've done some real some work to provide a central recognition procedure and co-funding through our special research fund to have a recognition process for core facilities. And um, that provides some co-funding to help um, towards uh, sustainability and self-sufficiency of um, the research centre. So here, a little bit about Gen CDH, which was awarded a, a research, uh, sorry, core facility center um, status in June 2022. So this is a, an opportunity to bring together highly specialized and indispensable scientific expertise, services and research infrastructure. So it's a really a platform to bring all the people together. Um, it promotes cooperation between researchers. So, for example, at Ghent, we work with computer science. We work sometimes with the natural science collections, for example, the herbarium or natural history collections. But we also, of course, work with our faculty. And it's open to all the university, uh, all the researchers at the university within and outside Ghent University. And just to give you an idea of how um, it's built up, so there are core facility building blocks, so there is an organizational structure, there is a core team um, with a, a, a course facility manager, my colleague Peter Yan, and there are various management tools in place, and my colleague uh, uh, Philippe in, in the room will know more about the details, but there's also things about housing and logistics and IT and communication. We're more of a sort of distributed infrastructure working with digital content, so that's a little bit different if you were working in the natural sciences and had physical equipment. So this core facility um, uh, framework is meant to be able to support all the different disciplines. So now let's move on from the university and uh, look at go into a sort of uh, into the European perspective. So here, this is at the Daria Europe level, and here you can see, well, you may not be able to read the slides, but we have um, the National Coordinating Institution for uh, Daria in Belgium is Ghent Centre for Digital Humanities, and our director, Christoph Verbrugge, who is a, a professor in digital humanities and uh, uh, contemporary history. He's the actual director of the centre and also is the leader of Daria in Belgium. So here you can see Belgium represented in the Daria EU uh, website. I just wanted to throw this in because I thought it may be of interest. So within Daria Europe, um, may, some of you may know um, about this landmark monitoring. So Daria is, is, has been a, a landmark since I think about, mm, I should say 2016 or so. And that means that we, as an infrastructure, we're an operational infrastructure. Um, but these landmarks are going to currently be monitored. So, for example, Clarin, uh, our sister infrastructure in the humanities and social science, is currently being monitored, and we're looking forward to that next year. But here, this is something from um, the Netherlands. 
And um, as part of um, their monitoring of national infrastructures, they did a very particular exercise related to going out to the researchers to see how visible the research infrastructures are in the particular communities we're meant to serve. So I think that was a very interesting example and will help us feed the landmark monitoring process as well. And uh, from research infrastructures, I wanted to start jumping uh, straight towards the European Open Science Cloud or EOSC. And um, again, there are interconnections there. I think Margarita mentioned it earlier. So Ghent University is um, a member of the EOSC Association, as is Daria EU. So from uh, various different institutional perspectives, we also have active participation in the EOSC Association. Now, I don't want to uh, complicate things uh, 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 completely here, but I wanted to sort of zoom out a bit. So if you imagine we're zooming out now. So within the broader EOSC ecosystem, um, there are various different cluster organizations. So here um, you can see all of the various different um, social sciences and humanities research infrastructure in the larger S3 landscape. Um, the ones on the left hand side where Daria is included are the landmark mark infrastructures and they have been going uh, longer, but the ones on the right hand side are the emerging ones. So you can see that there is a sort of, um, uh, uh, what's the word, well there is a critical mass of uh, research infrastructures and this is just the social science and humanities and that is not a, a static thing either. So if we're looking at to seeing how we can work together with other um, SSH infrastructures, particularly in the context of EOSC. So this is just to say that at the bottom of the screen, you can see that there were various um, thematic cluster projects or also known as science clusters. So here you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, there is the social sciences and humanities, but also environmental sciences, life sciences, material sciences, and then high energy physics and uh, astronomy and particle physics. So all of these different clusters come together as the sort of scientific um, contribution to the EOSC. So this is where the domains come in. So all of these cluster projects are now coming towards the end. And we're looking about sustainability of the science clusters themselves. So we had the project Social Sciences and Humanities Open Cloud, and now we are moving towards the Social Sciences and Humanities Open Cluster. So this is the sustainable service at the end of the project. So diving in a little bit deeper, because I think we wanted to talk about research infrastructures and the sort of challenges. So here, if we have um, the um, social sciences and humanities open marketplace. So if this was one of the core things that came out of the uh, shock project, this is kind of a catalog of tools, training materials, publications, data sets and workflows specifically for the social sciences and humanities. Um, so here uh, just gives an overview, but here if I go into a little bit more detail, if we look at workflows, and from my personal point of view, this is the most interesting. So research data is nothing without its interrelationship to the publications, between to training materials and to all the services that you use to analyze it. So here is just one example, uh, if my slides want to move forward, yes, great, um, of one of the workflows. So if we think about um, moving from the data to the workflows, here is an example from uh, the humanities and social sciences and how to create a dictionary in text encoding initiative. We have many dictionary makers in looking at historical dictionaries and different languages um, across Europe, and this gives them step-by-step -step guidelines. Um, and this, you can start to see the interconnections, which I think is absolutely crucial between the data, tools, services, publications inside the EOSC ecosystem. Now, zooming out again a little bit further, so, and I'm sure Roxana will say more about this later, 
Here is just a, a, a sort of look about if you go into um, EOSC as a whole, then you can see all the different disciplines. And here you can see a bit of a deep dive into all of the different disciplines behind the social science and humanities within the EOSC ecosystem. Now I just like to sort of give an idea of what it means to um, actually uh, onboard or integrate uh, the many different words we can use um, to become a provider um, within uh, the EOSC um, uh, landscape. So here again, we're looking at the social sciences and humanities, and I'll just use three examples of the, say, more closely related infrastructures here. So Daria, I've said a lot about, and Clarin is our sister infrastructure, merely really looking at language technologies, and SESTA is um, somewhere in the middle, and um, the Consortium of European Social Science Data Archives, and together we work very, very closely. So here you can see, uh, if you were to click on this link, and I I think the slides will be shared afterwards. This is what um, you as an infrastructure provider look like inside the EOSC ecosystem. But of course, we have all various different tools um, inside uh, our infrastructures. And this is a way, once that you've been onboarded as a provider, then you can add all of the resources that you provided. And just to say, this could be, so if I think of Ghent University, if we think right back to the beginning of the presentation, we're providing, for example, a corpus management platform um, from um, Ghent University. We can provide this to Daria Belgium, that pro we provide that to Daria Europe, and then it can end up in the European Open Science Cloud. That's the kind of idea. But here I'll just show the example of the SSH open marketplace that we just shown inside the EOSC portal. And now I just want to say a few words about integration with the EOS core services. So to make all those interconnections possible between the data, the services, the tools, the training information, we need to connect with various EOS core services. So one of my favorites is the authentication and authorization uh, infrastructure. So here as a member of the Daria community, or also as a member of Ghent University, I can use my local login to log in and be able to, for example, add more services to the SSH open marketplace. But only this is possible by able to be interconnecting with the core EOSC AAI Federation. And another example here, uh, this is the SESTA data catalog. So this is the other um, research infrastructure we have been talking about. Um, this is the one-stop shop for all of the social sciences and human um, humanities surveys that the SESTA data catalog collects. Here you can just see the monitoring service, and this helps the researchers to be able to um, see if the service is reliable. So, of course, um, I chose the one which is 100% reliable from our SESTA colleagues. Now zooming out a little bit more again, and um, some of you will probably know there's been a lot of EU project proposals at the moment, and to look at the maturity and the sustainability of some of these um, uh, four um, clusters, um, we've just um, submitted a proposal um, under one of the EOS calls to look at the future of the science clusters. So here in the bottom right of the screen, there is scienceclusters.eu. And uh, if our proposal were to be accepted, um, we will start looking at how we can work more closely with the other science clusters. So for example, in a first phase, the one that is just finished, we've been working together, particularly with the social sciences infrastructures to get to know each other, to get to understand our data. And now at this next level, we'll start working with, for example, um, high energy physics or material scientists. And it's been really interesting just to prepare the proposal because we found interconnections. So, uh, for example, the Panosk infrastructure here in, um, I, uh, in physics and material sciences 
that has been we've got a lot of data interests. So we're all looking at, for example, DOIs for data sets. And that is not just a humanities question, but it is all a question in the various different uh, research infrastructures. Now, just to wrap up, I want to shift gears a little bit. And this is where the more complicated bit comes in. So now I'm going to move beyond European research infrastructures, also beyond EOSC a bit, to um, where cultural heritage data is sitting and how we need to interconnect that as well. So um, I'm sure there are many um, humanities researchers in the room as well. But if we're looking at, for example, uh, digitized historical newspapers, archived web resources, archived social media, these are our primary resources in the humanities. So where do our primary resources and how do they fit into the research infrastructures and into our EOSC um, ecosystem? So if we think again from the institutional perspective, our university libraries, our university archives and museums are uh, often the core places where we get our data or the National Library, the National Archive or even beyond. So a couple of years ago already now, Daria wrote a paper on cultural heritage data from a humanities research perspective. And we started thinking about, okay, there is all this um, cultural heritage data out there. How do we make sure that it is fully integrated into this research data landscape? So it's not research data um, yet because it is the raw data that we need to work with but it also needs to be there next to the tools and services we are providing. So it's a sort of like, how does that fit into this um, overall research data ecosystem? So I wanted to just to mention two particular initiatives that are coming up. Um, so the European Collaborative Cloud for Cultural Heritage or the nice slips off your tongue acronym, ECCCCH. Um, this is just um, a starting now, and uh, this is why I'm afraid I'll have to leave you in a few minutes because it is the kickoff meeting of the first uh, session today um, run by the European Commission. There have been two reports that are maybe particularly interesting for you to have a look at and um, the sort of um, impact assessment report that was written first and then a stakeholders um, survey. It's very interesting in those reports because infrastructure such as Daria and Clarin and others are also mentioned in this report. So it may be interesting for you to have a look at these reports. Of course, it's never simple. So um, some of you may know Europeana um, as the flagship portal for collection of uh, humanities, cultural heritage data, sorry, cultural heritage data in Europe. Um, and this is um, now um, being coming part of one of the data spaces initiatives, which um, are more closely connected to EOSC. But here um, we've got the European Data Space for Cultural Heritage or DS4CH um, as it's being started. And this is being managed um, by uh, the Europeana um, Association and uh, Daria is also a, a partner in this. So we have got a lot of collaboration. Clarin also collaborates closely with, Cla uh, with Europeana as well. So there are some intersections between what is happening in terms of cultural heritage data. Um, you can see that my graphic design skills aren't the best, but this is the sort of the idea of how we can start interconnecting this. So if we've got the ecosystem of data spaces on the left hand side, cultural heritage just is just one of many of the ecosystems. So language for Clarin, that is particularly interesting, but you've got tourism, you've got energy, uh, Margarita mentioned uh, green and the Green Deal, agriculture. There are many different types of data spaces um, there as well. There also is something called the research data space, and it's not completely clear to me whether that is the European Open Science Cloud or not, but I think that will become more apparent as we move forward. And then you've got this collaborative cloud for cultural heritage. And this is particularly interesting because it's the first time that cultural heritage at European scale has been funded by um, research at the European level. So 
even if my diagram isn't very uh, uh, shiny, it's I think we really need to look at the interrelationships between these different initiatives. So just to sum that up, if you want to talk more about cultural heritage data as humanities research data, we'll be talking about it in June. And interestingly, this is um, where Daria's annual event is. Uh, we've had double the number of submissions. So it's obviously not just me that's interested in this topic. So a bit of a whistle stop tour from Ghent University um, towards um, these high level um, cultural heritage data spaces and how it fits in. But I hope it's been useful. And if just one, maybe just one lesson learned, it's very easiest for us to sit inside the research infrastructure inside the EOSC bubble. And I think it's one of the hardest things is to communicate all these things in an easy way for the researchers that need to use it. So if we could have one lesson learned uh, or one takeaway from that is remember that we are not always inside. Um, we need to break down the bubble, or I don't know quite the metaphor, but be able to communicate with a way that researchers understand. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Sally, for a really interesting insight into this rather complex area. Uh, is there someone in the audience who wish to pose a question? Okay, then I have a question uh, of my own since I work with the uh, physical objects related to uh, collections uh, of different kinds. Uh, and they are, of course, often biological materials and so on, but with a cultural uh, well, perspective. Uh, you are working with data primarily in the two-dimensional sense. Uh, do you have any... Uh, well, insights related to more uh, about integration of, of uh, uh, data related to physical objects and uh, uh, well, whatever information is in it, not just imaging, but also uh, chemistry and DNA. Yes. Yes, th thanks very much for a very fascinating question, Marguerite, and something that I don't know a lot about, but I can sort of <laughs> tell the people who, who do. So um, I can give two examples, well, three examples thinking about it. So um, on, the, on that slide with many different research infrastructures, there was the European Research Infrastructure for Heritage Science, or ERIS. Yes, yes. So I don't know if you're working with them, Margarita. Well, we are in a way, but Sweden isn't a member yet. We are. I'm. I'm. I'm involved with with a group who try to convince that the politicians in Sweden that we should be a member. So hopefully we will. <laughs> and I think sort of there's two things. One, so yes, we deal with more to a certain extent, more um, 2D objects, um, documentary um, newspapers, published material, and this sorts of things. But I think within the ECCH, um, so we're in discussions, all of the EC, well, I can't say it, the collaborative cloud proposals are due in September. So we've got uh, another few months to prepare those proposals, but at the infrastructural level, there are quite a lot of discussions between the different cultural heritage communities. So I'm very lucky. I've got a friend in Paris who works for Ipanema, I think, and she tells me about all of these beam lines where they take cultural heritage objects and uninvasively try to analyze them from an either chemical perspective. And this is where my knowledge ends. But I think this is really interesting. And I think in the ECCH domain, this is where we need to be able to have federated data hubs. So a digitized newspaper may be very different to the chemical components in either a manuscript, the sort of different golds and paints that were used, or towards more material sort of um, urban heritage. Um, we have a, a working group in Daria that does a lot of work with urban heritage in, in cities and that, this kind of things. Um, I know that from um, 
I went to a virtual museums uh, conference that was run by um, the Daria partners in, in Cyprus. And they've been doing a lot of work related to the metadata and how you describe from a technical perspective, all these things. Mm -hmm. So I'm not knowledgeable, but I know that we need to really start working together and understanding this different domains, but we can't all be experts in the same domain. So I think we've got to, bring the expertise together, show where the synergies are, but also where we need to keep things domain specific, I would say. Yeah. I think that's very good reflections and also illustration uh, showing the importance of why collaboration is so important because if we are really going to extract the uh, information in new ways and also utilize new ways that uh, data may provide to, to uh, how we actually do research, so to say, uh, I think it's important that we can work uh, cross-disciplinary and uh, also interoperate data. Uh, Sally is now sharing the link uh, to the, this is a new European infrastructure, uh, ERIS, which is in heritage science. And it will be, I think, the COVID 19 made uh, some delays to the project, to, to, to the process, but it's uh, coming up soon, as far as I know. Uh, yeah. Any more quest questions from the audience? If someone would like to propose something to Sally you have a few minutes left well maybe somebody's thinking just to give one more example well two well two kind of more examples as well so even in the library world um we're doing quite a lot so for example we've got um cuneiform tablets so at Ghent University there are researchers in Arcadian studies um, where we're trying to do um, optical character recognition of um uh, cuneiform scripts on and based on these tablets as well. So for me, this is text analysis, um, but uh, text in a slightly different form. And then we need to look as though, would that research data, so this is coming at the federal level in Belgium, so it's part of one of the museums, would that research data go to the Heskida, which is their data portal for heritage science, would it come to Daria or should it just go into a bigger portal where anybody who needs it can look at it? And I would go yeah. for the, the last one, I think. Thank you very much, Sally. Uh, if there is no more comments from the audience, I would like to proceed in the pro program. And uh, we are now uh, going into more biological sciences and the next speaker is Mr. Volman Nyberg Åkerström. He has a background in scientific computing, publishing and business development and he is at present a part of the bioinformatics infrastructure in Sweden uh, where he's an expert in management, service design, integration and repositories. Uh, he's also involved on European level in Elixir as well as in the EOSC task force for semantic operabil interoperability. So welcome, Volmar. Uh, and hopefully we may see your slides. All right. Mm -hmm. I am here and let me see if you can see my slides. So that is perhaps one of the challenges. Uh, and let me see, I need to move zoom over so I can see the chat if there's any questions popping up or will you keep track of that perhaps Marilyn is keeping track of the chat fantastic so uh, let me share these slides does that work no sorry about that um, i will give it a second try Now it's are we in business more. all right so thank you and, and sorry about that I, I jumped in here from another meeting so I, I don't really have the context and please fill me in if i'm repeating something that should be obvious to the the, the crowd already uh, so you already mentioned where i'm from and what i'm affiliated with uh, and uh, 
I will take the perspective of a national infrastructure when I give this presentation. So it's the National Bioinformatics Infrastructure Sweden. Uh, we are hosted at Uppsala University uh, and we have staff across uh, all of Sweden. And I will focus a little bit on interoperability in the life sciences because I am affiliated with the Yosk Association Task Force on Semantic Interoperability, as was just mentioned. And then also some of the projects that we are involved in are related to converging on practices for sharing research information and tools in the life sciences. Uh, so uh, NBIS is basically a patchwork of infrastructures. Uh, or we, we have uh, connections to several different infrastructures. And when you work in the life sciences in Sweden, you will probably need to get in touch with not just one, but several infrastructures to get the resources that you need. Uh, and uh, the image here to the right illustrates that NBIS is at the center of the National Infrastructure for Computing, uh, the uh, Uppsala node in that compute infrastructure. Uh, but at the same time at the life science uh, infrastructure that also offers services for data capture uh, and uh, other uh, kind of technology specific uh, services. Uh, and then we also have collaborations with the Swedish universities where our staff are located and also all other universities are welcome to uh, list their services. Uh, in addition to that, we also engage in Nordic projects, uh, often through the Nordic e-infrastructure collaboration under Nordforsk uh, and in the uh, already mentioned Elixir uh, infrastructure, which is focused on uh, life science information resources. Uh, so it's focused on bioinformatics and access to data uh, in, in uh, this domain. Uh, so, uh, Elixir Sweden is actually coordinated by uh, the NBIS infrastructure. Uh, and uh, I will highlight some aspects of this infrastructure that I consider are key in enabling open science. Uh, and uh, we work in three strands of work. So we offer support, training, and we also build and provide infrastructure. Uh, and uh, one important aspect of this is data management. And uh, I work at the data management team. So this will also reflect my perspective quite a lot. Uh, and we have expressed in the vision for our team and the, the mission that we are working towards that we should encourage life science researchers to apply good data management practices. And this will uh, lead to uh, people uh, adhering more to the principles of open science, reproducible research and fair. And this is in line with the European open science cloud uh, initiatives. Uh, I also wanted to show this slide because we have really grown uh, the team of data stewards that we have. So uh, when I started in, in 2020, we were two, uh, there were two people uh, in the year before that. And then we uh, ended up being, I think, five people, and then we recruited more staff. So uh, these people are working with giving support to Swedish researchers, uh, but also contributing in European projects to converge on, on shared practices and developing uh, shared resources. And some examples under each strand of work uh, is uh, for support. We offer data management planning and good practices uh, kind of uh, support. It can be both hands-on or in the form of consultations and, and um, just uh, dropping in at a regular scheduled call to ask us questions. Uh, we offer uh, support for publishing data code and other outputs and then also some considerations specifically for working with sensitive data since that's a common uh, issue in, in the life sciences. Uh, and we also uh, kind of in general help with preparing uh, data and outputs for sharing and reuse. So not just for publishing. Uh, we also provide training uh, and uh, develop uh, training materials that we uh, offer to anyone who would like to reuse it or adapt it to their own purposes. 
uh, we have uh, regular events promoting uh, different aspects of data, good data management practices and open sciences. Uh, and we also uh, do embedded teaching in uh, existing programs in Sweden or uh, at our partners in Elixir, of course. Uh, and for infrastructure, uh, we have a set of guidelines, uh, websites that connect to international resources, but give a Swedish national perspective with some aspects that are specific to Sweden. Uh, we also uh, offer a federated infrastructure for uh, discovery and access to sensitive human research data. Uh, and uh, we also have a, a hub for uh, medical imaging uh, data that can be used in AI uh, training and applications. Uh, and currently, we are also contributing to a project uh, to develop a genomic data infrastructure uh, to uh, get access uh, to both clinical and research uh, applications across Europe. And promoting uh, the FAIR principles in the life sciences entails uh, quite a lot. Uh, and there are many already existing best practices. I'm not going to go through all of the listed uh, tiny text pieces that are at the bottom here, uh, but just illustrating the general process of, of uh, going from study design and, and thinking about how to compose different pieces of infrastructure uh, and finding good standards to adopt uh, and uh, uh, how to plan how to share your data uh, is really important. And then you have a spectrum of activities where you will need to record uh, some kinds of information in order to, to be able to make the data really reusable. Uh, and, uh, I would say that uh, the work that we're doing in Elixir uh, and also at MDIS locally uh, and working with our researchers uh, goes into giving uh, guidance and finding solutions to how to uh, best uh, record your data or finding conventions for um, uh, how to publish it in the best possible manner. And this goes beyond data, of course, so it includes tools, software, workflows, uh, protocols, and, and anything uh, related to research, really. Uh, we have been contributing to uh, some projects coordinated by Elixir to build shared resources for uh, best practices in data management. Uh, and one of them is the Research Data Management Kit. Uh, and this is a, a resource that is targeted uh, to uh, data stewards mainly, uh, but uh, data stewards at the no national node could reference this uh, resource or, or provide links to this resource with some national context. Uh, and that's the approach that we have taken at uh, the uh, Elixir Sweden node uh, when we develop our guidance. So we have Swedish uh, context specific information and then we link out to these uh, shared resources. Uh, the FAIR cookbook uh, contains recipes uh, at the different levels of complexity, so some can be on a uh, uh, conceptual level, uh, whereas others are really into the nitty gritty details of how you should execute different uh, software programs to get data in a shape that makes it available uh, or shareable across uh, uh, different data repositories. Uh, and then we also have the data uh, stewardship wizard, which is a tool for creating data management plans based on questionnaires. Uh, and you can build uh, pretty advanced questionnaires, reference external resources. Uh, and uh, this is very useful uh, for someone who is, is not really uh, familiar with, with the data management planning. Uh, and also you can customize this to a very high degree, which means that you can include things that are very specific to your infrastructure or, or the general life sciences situation in the country. Um, some other shared resources is that we have a selection, a curated selection of uh, data resources that we uh, suggest that people use data, uh, looking for data use, uh, and then also some re resources that we recommend for depositing data. 
Uh, and uh, there's also a selection of uh, interoperability resources, which gives guidance on how to best uh, prepare data and, and adopt uh, which standards you should adopt for certain types of, of uh, uh, research projects. Uh, another example is that we're converging on some shared infrastructures, and I think by COVID was mentioned, uh, or maybe I misheard that. My colleague will, however, present the uh, work with the uh, COVID-19 data portal, as far as I understood. Uh, and uh, in that, uh, you will see the Swedish uh, side and perhaps the connection to the uh, international part of this as well. So bringing together several data resources harmonizing them in a way uh, that they can be exposed uh, and discovered through a shared interface uh, and uh, kind of working on making a this as a pleasant experience as possible for researchers looking to reuse data. And this is to a large degree uh, done in the scope of uh, a this European wide federated infrastructure that is Elixir. Uh, and currently it's a network of 23 national nodes uh, and uh, there's a hub uh, coordinating uh, some of the activities and, and projects that uh, Elixir uh, supports. Uh, it has five platforms, so there's a platform for tools, compute, uh, training, interoperability and data. Uh, and these work towards developing and curating these shared resources within Elixir. Then there are 15 communities that rely on these different uh, platforms and also provide use cases or um, uh, suggestions for things to be developed by Elixir. Uh, aside from that, we also have 10 focus groups that are looking at specific issues. Uh, and then we have the EU projects and internal projects that drive the development of new services and resources. So collectively, all of these nodes and activities uh, contribute to uh, offering uh, hundreds of bioinformatics services uh, that are available to life science researchers and that we can offer through, through our node. Uh, and uh, when it comes to EOSC, Elixir has a strategy for aligning with the developments in EOSC. Uh, Elixir is pretty mature as a, a federated infrastructure already, and we have practices in place, including uh, AI uh, authorization and login infrastructure and uh, all of these data resources. So we're looking for ways of leveraging EOSC uh, and contributing to the development of EOSC that uh, kind of are mutually beneficial to the largest degree possible. So. Um, there are mappings between uh, most of the platforms and activities in Elixir to corresponding projects and activities in EOSC. Uh, and um, we're uh, also looking into bringing into aspects of EOSC into the communities and, and all of the services that uh, we are uh, offering in, in Elixir. Uh, Elixir is also engaged in the EOSC Association task forces. Uh, and there is a representation from Elixir across all of the uh, five different advisory groups. Uh, and I think most, if not all of the task forces has at least one representative uh, from Elixir. Uh, and then we have a e Elixir EOSC focus group that has been active for quite a while. Uh, it convenes monthly. Uh, and uh, one of the standing bullets on the agenda is to report back on activities in the task forces. Uh, and then we have a larger group to discuss uh, issues or suggestions that we could bring into the, the expert groups uh, and uh, show the Elixir um, uh, proposed solutions that uh, could be brought into this context uh, and uh, also bringing up ideas that perhaps could be used or incorporated into the different platforms. Uh, from Envis side, we have three people involved in uh, the uh, task forces in overall, and two of us are co-chairs of, of uh, task forces. Uh, and I am co-chair for the Semantic Interoperability Task Force. Uh, and then uh, we have a, a colleague of mine, Jessica Lindvall, working in, at Stockholm University, uh, who is co-chair for the uh, upskilling countries to engage with the EOSC task force. 
Uh, and I wanted to say a few words about the semantic interoperability task force as well, uh, since it's focused on interoperability. Uh, and uh, I mean, in general, uh, we wanted to illustrate how we are engaging with uh, these uh, European infrastructures. And, and uh, one way of engaging is to be part of these task forces and contribute to the activities that they're uh, working towards. Uh, uh, the start of this set of task forces uh, might have been a little bit shaky. Uh, the work didn't start in most of the task forces uh, at the time when uh, they, they were formed. It took a few months before the, the actual work really took off. And originally, uh, the outputs that were defined in the different charters for the, the task forces uh, were not uh, clearly defined in a way that they could be um, uh, delivered as coherent recommendations for EOSC, if I, if I express it like that. Uh, and then there were also all of these EOSC projects that had been initiated before the EOSC Association even had uh, been conceived and uh, that haven't really had uh, interactions with the task forces in their uh, plans from the beginning. Uh, so uh, from the original task force structure, we had some ideas on what we should work towards. Some of those were thematic uh, explorations of semantic interoperability. Uh, and uh, that would entail uh, the task force members themselves uh, looking into the uh, interoperability activities that are going on around them and perhaps related to the EOSC projects that they are involved in and bring that into the group discussion uh, to converge on for example, scientific articles, conference presentations, events, uh, and uh, things uh, that could be presented as reports or guidelines on semantic interoperability. Uh, some of the work uh, would also entail strategic knowledge exchange, and these would be in the form of workshops uh, and also working together with people outside of the task forces. Uh, and converging then on, on recommendations. So I think we are still uh, kind of in ongoing activities across all of these three uh, lines, but we're moving towards more converging on recommendations uh, at the moment. Uh, we have divided the work into three streams of work. So one focusing on metadata and data standards. Uh, we are also looking at semantic artifact catalogs, as we call them, which is basically catalogs of vocabularies uh, and how they describe different vocabularies and, and uh, what uh, criteria and or dimensions of maturity uh, are uh, in relation to these. And then we're also looking at use cases, which is where I started uh, engaging with this task force. And I also hope that that would be an interesting venue to engage with our work. Uh, and uh, depending on the group's interest uh, today, uh, I could show some slides related to that or just share a uh, link to a presentation that I gave during the EOSC symposium uh, this fall or I prepared for, and, and a colleague in Elixir actually presented it. So there are extensive speaker notes that he, he followed when presenting that talk. Uh, and uh, go, moving forward here, uh, I think for the EOSC Association uh, to be able to present some recommendations based on our work, we're going to kind of work towards consolidating the outputs here and, and putting it into uh, some shorter and recommendation-focused uh, uh, content uh, and um, I'm not sure how well represented the task force is among the uh, Enlight partners, uh, but at least in Elixir, uh, I think we have uh, uh, a node in almost all of the countries, uh, but uh, par one. Uh, and then I think uh, the partner universities in Enlight uh, about half of them are actually affiliated with the, the Elixir node in their country. Uh, so, I mean, if you have people who are engaged in the life sciences and would be interested in, in working on these kinds of solutions, uh, I think it's a low barrier to get in touch with the Elixir, either through your node, uh, through um, uh, the Elixir node in your country, uh, or 
uh, by getting in touch with someone who is engaged uh, in it in, in another country uh, within in your discipline, so to speak. Uh, and that could also bring in discussions about how to interact with Elixir uh, or, or the wider EOS community. So I'm not sure how I am on time. Uh, Quite good, <laughs> I would say. No, you, you have another 10 minutes. Yes, fantastic. So in that case, I mean, if there are any questions with regards to Elixir and, and uh, uh, the interactions with EOSC, uh, perhaps we could take them now and I could prepare to uh, give the a second part of the presentation where I, I pitch uh, how to use uh, case studies and use cases as a way of uh, demonstrating value to stakeholders. And I, I would hope that maybe this could engage some people to uh, uh, work with the semantic interoperability task force. There is a question from Professor Tony Hay. Uh, yes, I'm curious. I, I, I've worked with Carol Goebel in the past, and she was looking at semantic web technologies for many years. But now she's looking at um, what she calls bio schemas for findability and interoperability, which is based on schema.org, which is the uh, 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 standard for, for adding uh, semantic information, a little bit of semantic information to web pages and things like that. Are, are you considering things like bio schemas and schema.org? Uh, I mean, yes, we are. So that, that is part of the interoperability platform and, and one of the, the uh, recommended interoperability solutions. Uh, from uh, the Swedish node perspective, I don't think we have actually implemented it in any parts, uh, uh, or maybe we have it implemented in one of the, the data repositories, but not widely across all of our services. So that might require some time still. Uh, we do plan to incorporate it in our uh, training materials. So uh, there, there is a profile for, for training materials in Bioschemas that uh, we will make sure to encode in the pages where we uh, advertise the, the courses and also uh, linking out and, and uh, annotating the, the uh, training materials themselves with it. Okay, I mean, and what's what's the role of, of the full semantic web technologies? Do people you want to use those for interoperability or not? I mean, I think a pragmatic approach is the only realistic one. Uh, and uh, Carol Gobel has been a very avid opponent uh, proponent for, for that. <laughs> so, I, I mean, I, I, I'm inclined to agree, but I wasn't sure that everybody in EOSC adopted that view. Yeah, I, I would say maybe not everyone is uh, adopting that view, but in order to, to, I mean, realistically get something to work, uh, there will be a need to uh, consider both perspectives, I think, because, I mean, having people who are interested in the semantic web and really uh, going into the nitty gritty details of modeling uh, the, the domains uh, is very useful for, for supporting searches. I'm not sure that would be like the, the one and end all solution uh, ever, but uh, at least bioschemas can incorporate uh, kind of definitions and vocabularies that are uh, developed elsewhere. Uh, and there are uh, different ways of, of kind of encoding uh, references to uh, vocabularies or, or more expressive semantic models in, for example, the RO crate. Uh, research object crate, I think it's the short for, which Carol Gobel also has been very uh, active in developing. So uh, the, I think these practical solutions that link into the more advanced concepts is, is the way to go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, maybe you have five more minutes, uh, Volmar, for um, you had some more slides. Yes, fantastic. Maybe so more uh, opportunities for questions later. <laughs> yes, indeed. And I mean, th this will be, uh, I won't be talking to all of the slides. I will skip some of them since, uh, I mean, you can go back to the uh, speaker notes at a later point if you want to. Uh, but I wanted to show uh, this as an example of how uh, I would say that 
the communities have contributed to develop Elixir. So, I mean, the communities that uh, we have in, in Elixir, they uh, have defined use cases and uh, problems that they want to solve uh, and uh, explain those to the platforms uh, in a way that, I mean, you can develop services or, or, or make incremental improvements. Uh, these uh, kinds of use cases can come in many different shapes. Uh, and uh, I mean, you can have a case study describing uh, a specific uh, solution that someone has found and, and that you might want to adopt in a different domain uh, or uh, describe a use case that is not possible today that you would like to enable. Uh, and uh, I am collecting some of these for the task force itself, but Elixir has also been collecting uh, interoperability stories. I mean, uh, good examples and, and problems that have been solved from the, the life sciences community. Uh, and uh, Elixir's communities, they have been around for a very long time, uh, but they are at different stages of maturity. Uh, and. Uh, you could probably uh, think about the different cluster project as some sort of community, uh, but a very broad, very, very broad communities uh, uh, that could define uh, user stories uh, or, or requirements for uh, the entirety of EOSC. Uh, but I, I think it's good to be at the very specific level if you want to have solutions that are uh, really um, sure to work for, for those uh, implementations. And perhaps uh, one can kind of work at different uh, levels of abstraction to uh, converge on a shared vision of, of what we really uh, want to achieve. Uh, so uh, I, I, in this case, and in the work that we have been doing in the semantic interoperability task force, I would say that a use case demonstrate uh, like the value uh, that you're trying to achieve uh, in, uh, uh, by, by uh, implementing a certain solution. Uh, it can also describe in general terms the steps uh, that you're expected to take uh, to, to achieve that goal or, or uh, realize that value. Uh, and they could be used for adopters so that they can recognize themselves uh, in uh, these implementation and really say that this is what we want. And it could also be used for builders to understand uh, the problems uh, since they might not have the full picture otherwise. Uh, and then having a large set of these use cases could also enable policymakers to see uh, if there are gaps in representation. I mean, communities that haven't really presented their use case or, or their point of view, uh, and also make sure that, I mean, you can really harmonize across the, the different communities and see if there are conflicts, conflicts that need to be resolved. Uh, and I mean, there are examples of uh, very broad use cases uh, in the EOS uh, portal. Uh, these are not really uh, enough for anyone to build a solution based off. Uh, so you would need to go into more details. And there are several European projects that have uh, detailed use cases. But as far as I know, there's no kind of uh, collection of them uh, in, in a single place where you could search and annotate them in a way that you could compare across different domains or disciplines uh, and find reusable components of those use cases. Uh, so I would propose capturing use cases at different levels. Uh, so uh, looking at the case studies uh, of real world scenarios where researchers are uh, sharing their data and uh, the tools and other pieces of, of solutions that enable it. Uh, and then uh, you could also consider that it's okay to describe a use case um, as something that's business focused. I mean, realizing the value for an organization or a group. Uh, but it could also be very kind of task specific that I'm trying to do this, uh, like uh, interacting with a certain type of service uh, and preparing data to, to work with that service and then being shared in a specific platform or, or something on those lines. Uh, Thank and you so much, Volmar. Uh, if you have something very short, uh, you can add it, but now the time is only a minute or so left. <laughs> yes. So that's the, the final punchline here is that, I mean, I think all of these, the case studies that are real and concrete uh, and the more use case uh, outline perspectives uh, can contribute to create kind of conceptual models of the problems uh, that you can use to 
be able to search and compare for different solutions across disciplines uh, and also identify shared problems that could be solved uh, or shared solutions that could be adopted uh, across different uh, EOSC communities. Thank you very much. Uh, we are now going into a coffee break, uh, 15 minutes uh, according to the schedule. Uh, there will of course be opportunities for more of these interesting discussions uh, by the end of this seminar where, where they have uh, 30 minutes for uh, questions and so on. Uh, we, I will close the screen for 15 minutes and then uh, welcome back uh, by 10.30 when we start all over again and we will have more interesting presentations. Um, see you later. Welcome back then. Uh, clock has passed 10.30 and uh, uh, the presentation of our next, next speaker is on the screen. Uh, I will then introduce Katarina Öjefors Stark from the SciLife Lab Data Center. Among other things, she is involved in the Swedish COVID-19 portal. The portal is now a part of the European Pathogens platform where other pathogens or possible pandemics are monitored. Uh, when COVID-19 rapidly appeared, it changed a lot in what we were used to uh, related to an open society. And there was, of course, also a lot of interest from researchers and decision makers. Society managed to rapidly set up a portal for data sharing. 
and Katarina will uh, introduce us to this work and lessons learned. Uh, please, Katarina, we are eager to hear your experience. Yes, uh, thank you so much, Margareta, for this really nice uh, introduction. And I'm very happy to be here to be able to present um, data sharing on the pandemic preparedness portal. I would say experiences and lessons learned. Um, going back a little bit with the um, background. So at the height of the pandemic in 2020, um, the Swedish node of the European COVID-19 data platform, hence the Swedish COVID-19 data portal, um, was originally launched. It was an, on an original assignment from the Swedish Research Council for the first two years, 2020-2021. And the aim to promote open science, fair and data sharing in order to accelerate COVID-19 research and also serve as a support platform for all the Swedish researchers uh, that rapidly uh, went into working almost full time with COVID-19. Um, the Swedish node of the European COVID-19 data platform has also been raised as a pioneer for COVID-19 national portals all around Europe by the European Commission. And we have also over these years been partnering with several uh, international efforts. Um, so um, the primary target group for the portal is, of course, the research community. But over time, we know that also the public, uh, journalists, uh, policymakers, um, people working in healthcare and industry have also used the portal and the portal resources to find and access COVID-19 data and resources. Um, in 2022, uh, we became a central part, one of the central pillars, I would say, of the Silaf Lab Pandemic Laboratory Preparedness Program. So we are now actually the center part of that program. Uh, that also meant that we were kind of changing our scope from being solely COVID-19 into going into more pandemic preparedness. Uh, so we are now, just as Margareta mentioned, actually also including other diseases and, and pathogens. So we're broadening the scope. Uh, we're also putting more focus on different resources for researchers that are related to, to pandemic uh, preparedness. Uh, in addition, uh, there is another Silaf Lab research program, which is called the Data Driven Life Science Program, the DDLS, which is funded from Silaf Lab and the Wallenbier Foundation. And we're also bridging over to this research program. Uh, just to give you a slight overview of the pandemic preparedness portal, we have, for example, dashboards, and these are actually based on data sets from different research groups. They're also accompanied by downloadable data. Uh, we have what we call the data highlights, and these are data-centric data news items, and they're really focused on what we would say good examples of research groups, um, current research groups that are adhering to open science by sharing data, sharing code, maybe sharing apps and so on. Uh, we're also showing available data sets um, and the available data sets, they're actually data sets that are mined from different repositories. And uh, we're using a Python script to do this. What we are using is we're mining in the Swedish publication database for COVID research. And the Swedish Publications database is another of our resources which we set up really early on. It's now been ongoing for about three years. Uh, we're collating all Swedish COVID-19 research output and actually not just in life sciences, in actually in, in all sciences. So you, you may find things for sociology there also or uh, pedagogics, for example. We have a special section which is called uh, social sciences these days. Um, we also have data sharing. We have resources, guidelines, and tools and information which can be used to support research groups to share their data. Because, uh, as I mentioned, sharing the resources is the way we can maximize um, the research uh, that will benefit uh, pandemic preparedness research and also, of course, uh, benefit COVID-19 research. Um, I mentioned the resources. These resources are connected to this pandemic laboratory preparedness program that I just mentioned. We're also showing the news and we have a section which is talking about uh, the portal and a little bit of background what's been going on since we have essentially broadened our scope over these three years. But 
The focus of the content really is on fair and open data. And we're trying to encourage and support sharing of data and code. We do this in many different ways. We have guidances for data and code submission. We have a help desk, and this is actually run together with ENVIS, the National Bioinformatics Infrastructure, um, Sweden, uh, which Volmar is, is presenting from. Uh, we're also producing guidances for using relevant resources, specific resources. And for us, it's really important to practice what we preach. So everything we do is open. All the code that's produced for the portal, both to set up a similar portal, but also for all the dashboards is actually openly available. And this has proven really important because yes, in the beginning of the pandemic, as Sweden had the first national portal, our portal could be used as a template for many of the other European portals that were set up uh, as early as um, 2020. And we're really, really happy about this. Um, another and going forward with focus on fair and open, we're doing this in, in many different ways. We are, as I mentioned, we have the data highlights, this data-centric news items. We're working with different partner projects. We're also working with different research projects to make their data available and accessible. Uh, we're using the social media to spread the information about this. And we are also producing separate sections that can be highlighting a specific research group's um, data, for example. In addition, we're also collaborating uh, with uh, external partners, and one of them is the Biobank Sweden. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so if you look at the dashboards, the data in these dashboards comes from many different um, groups, many different research groups. For example, we have a close collaboration with the research groups that are sharing wastewater data, and this has been really popular um, over these three years. Uh, when we're collaborating with the research groups, it's really important that we have information from with methods they're using, publications they have, for example, connected to this data, and we're feeding it into different plots that are in-house made, and these plots can be used for promotion and publication. Other parts of the data that we're showing on the portal may be from public data sources, and currently we're primarily focusing on vaccines and post-COVID, and all the code that's produced for these is, of course, also openly available. Uh, we also have dashboards that are showing partner projects, uh, and that's like to promote these um, projects uh, by giving them um, what we call a window towards the research community. Because what we do know, has this really been successful? I mean, that's the overall question. Yes, I think it has. Uh, over the first two years, we had a little bit over 70,000 visitors and about a quarter of a million page views. Uh, and as you see, most of them was, of course, from Sweden, but our target, primary target group is the research community in Sweden, so this makes sense. But we also actually had visitors from almost all over the world, and that's also been evident that a lot of people have been in contact with us, uh, both for suggestions of, of content, but also that they would like to know more, for example, or get into contact with a certain research group that uh, whose data we're showing. Uh, so we have been... Um, well, essentially facilitating uh, future collaborations. Um, if we look between June 2022 and so now March 2023, we had about 56,000 visits and about, well, I think it would probably be uh, closer to 80,000 now page views. Still primarily Sweden, but we still have uh, quite a lot of interest from all over the world. So what experiences have we done and what lessons have we learned? And this is to uh, target it towards if somebody would like to set up a similar portal, uh, it just doesn't have to be in life sciences, but it has to, uh, around a specific theme. So what has been really important for us, especially in the beginning, that you had staff that's working 100% with the project, and you also had the dedicated funding that made it possible for staff to work 100%. Um, it's also been really helpful for us to have staff with particular or rather uh, different uh, backgrounds and, and skills. So some people in the team have had really strong life science backgrounds. Some have been in, in, public, in uh, communications. Some have had skills in web development, visualizations, and so on. So we have been kind of complementing each other. Uh, using a software. Uh, well, I would recommend use a software that's easy for everyone to edit and add content to. We're using Jugo and uh, the content is actually in Markdown. So this is actually minimal technical skill that's needed to add or edit basic content. 
Um, adhering to open science, we really want to keep this accessible. So we have a public GitHub repository, and this has allowed the community and also community volunteers to quickly add and edit. Uh, this was especially important when we were setting up in 2020 to get this head start uh, in the summer of 2020. Uh, the next lesson learned is about content. You want to have a main focus of your content. And for us, it was on research data management and support to accelerate COVID-19 research. That's how we started. Uh, we also, um, as time moved on, started to build more and more resources, um, you know, like depending on what the research community was asking for. Uh, we have sections that are also good for community building. So this is actually drawing the researchers into the resource. Uh, for example, we have aggregated funding opportunities, it's of course very popular. Uh, we also show ongoing research projects. We have this publications database, which is essentially the whole Swedish COVID-19 uh, research output since the start of the pandemic. Uh, and we have the data highlights. Uh, and I think that all of the content actually shows that we really want to showcase good examples. We want to encourage best practices. Um, environment. Well, you really need a clear mandate for the work, and this is connected to, I would say, the, the first lesson learned about the people, because you, you really need clear funding to be able to do this. And we have been really fortunate because we have been kind of embedded, if I may use that word, uh, in a research community that was set up in, in Silaf Lab just from the beginning of the pandemic, because Silaf Lab uh, had a research program uh, with a number of calls um, directed towards um, specifically COVID-19 research that started in 2020 and they're still ongoing, uh, a couple of them. Uh, so that collated about 100 plus projects and they were all directed to the portal and the portal team for support, both for data management and data sharing. So we really got embedded into this great research community with, re with researchers all over Sweden very early on. Uh, the same thing with the research council, they have also been directing questions to us questions to us about the data management. Um, and we even, um, especially in the beginning of the pandemic, we have been having this outreach. So we were reaching out to research projects that were actually not funded from the Research Council or from the Silof Lab um, projects, but, but from actually from any projects, just working with COVID-19, actually offering them our support if we could help them with data sharing, just to accelerate research uh, in, a, in a national level. And that was also very, very popular, and we were managed to help and been in contact with, I think, more than 250 projects and counting at this point. Uh, if we look at the international, it's also really important, of course, to have an international context. And uh, being the Swedish node of the European COVID-19 data portal gave us this network and also this connection to Emble EBI, which we are now building on. Uh, yes, as Margareta mentioned, we are... Um, moving towards uh, being part of the pathogens. Um, and we are still part of the network of uh, international COVID-19 data portals. There have been meetings and, and also uh, connections between these portals over time. And today we're also part and, and a partner of uh, one of the Horizon projects called BioCOVID. It's, it's really a nice project. Um, that's also very closely connection, connected to the Infectious Disease Toolkit, which is going to be built up. And this Infectious Disease Toolkit is actually an ongoing contentathon in Ghent, just as we speak, where my colleague Eliane Hughes, who is our project lead for um, the portal, is participating. And that's why I'm presenting instead of her today, I should probably mention. Uh, but they are actually building the, the national... Uh, instance of the infectious disease tools kits at uh, we speak, and I would be very happy to share links to these uh, at a later point. Um, and I think the last lesson is about longevity. Well, you have to keep your portal, in that case, relevant, because of course, when it was established, the main focus was on COVID-19. And now, I guess as the pandemic has been changing over time and going in waves, we also have to, in, in essence, evolve. Um, but then it's really important to, <clears throat> to um, remember that even if you are evolving and broadening your 
community. You have to remember that you have an existing community, in our case, the COVID-19 community. You still, you don't want to alienate them, but you have to really work with just broadening the scope. And this has been really important for us uh, over the last year when we have been broadening our scope to be more of a Swedish pandemic preparedness portal than the sole COVID-19 data portal as we started. Uh, and we have learned that it's really necessary to be clear and have a clear communication if you do the transition, because people need to understand this is not a new effort with a pandemic preparedness portal. It's just actually uh, a broadening of the COVID-19 data portal at this point. And just to finish off, I want to tell you just a little bit what we're doing now when we're moving forward. Um, as I have mentioned several times, we have expanded the scope. Uh, it's actually not just pandemic preparedness, it's also infectious diseases and AMR. We're building new um, features to reflect this. We have a really nice feature which is called emerging pathogens. This is designed to be able to rapidly collate information on emerging pathogens. So for example, when the information came out on, on monkeypox last year, uh, we were able to put this page with collated information in a Swedish context text up uh, within, I think, a week or two. And that's something we have also set up in case there would be a new emerging pathogen. Uh, and we're also moving forward and collaborating even more with this um, Swedish Pandemic Laboratory Preparedness Program and also the network of laboratories and research programs and governmental agencies that's uh, built up. And yes, to finish, uh, of course, research um, is really important to have the researchers view. So enable, we're enabling and increasing the community engagement. And the way we're doing this is just yes, after Christmas now, we have set up an editorial committee. And this these six researchers have um, graciously um, agreed to be part of our, our editorial committee. They are representing different parts uh, of the infectious disease uh, field, and they have different skill sets that are very useful for us. Uh, we are collaborating with this team of researchers to set up both new content. They are advising us on essentially like a user case, what's needed by the research community at this point, what is useful, what is beneficial, what, what is actually missing on the portal. And uh, they are also increasing uh, the visibility of the portal. Um, in the research community, and then especially, of course, the research community connected to uh, pandemic preparedness, infectious diseases, AMR, and so on. And by that, I would like to thank you all for listening, of course, and also thank my uh, members of the, the portal team, both past and present. This is the present team. And of course, all our the research groups that are sharing data and have been in contact with us. and. Uh, really doing a great great job in this uh, there are partner projects uh, the community and many more and of course our funders silaf lab the knut nalis wallenberg foundation by covid and the swedish research council and i really encourage you to go into pandemic preparedness portal.se uh, see what kind of resources we have collated uh, and if that will be useful for you and you can always follow us in social media on twitter or linkedin and with that, I'm opening the floor for questions. Thank you so much. I will. I think I will stop sharing her. Questions from the audience. Otherwise, I have a few thoughts. Uh, um, first, uh, well. How do you consider the? You talked a little about funding and, and the importance of a, some kind of organization that is actually mandated and so on. But when this pandemic uh, rise, uh, there was a call for action rather rapidly. And as you can see, that Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation has been a, an important partner. Uh, do you? So to say, uh, since they have their own uh, fortunes, so to say, <laughs> to put into things, they think it's uh, well worth funding uh, substantially and rapidly. Do you have some experiences in that uh, in order to actually perform things uh, now and not in two or three years or so on? 
Uh, well, I should probably point out that when uh, the portal was launched, actually, we were funded from the Swedish Research Council for the first two years. So they were the ones that were really uh, rapidly uh, allocated funding for, for us to, to start up. Uh, but of course, that's uh, always uh, the thing with these kind of um, uh, projects, or if you build a resource, you have to think uh, long term, how you're going to be able to preserve it. Uh, longevity is not just to keep your, uh, uh, well, it's not just to keep um, the researcher and your research community interested, and you, you want to keep it relevant. But of course, you always have to have uh, funding for it. Um, and that's, uh, of course, something that we are continuously working with. And um, yes, I, that's what I can say at this point. Um, but we're also, since we're broadening our scope, we may also have uh, different funders in, in, in the long run. It's interesting because that's sometimes a challenge that if you have to apply for funding, there may be uh, quite a lot of uh, lay time in order to actually receive something and, and uh, there may be some some no's before you have a yes and so on. And, and if there is something that's really a societal challenge, uh, there may be a need to do something rather quickly. Yeah, but I think that was very evident that all of these funding opportunities that actually arise for, for both for researchers, just, not just talking about the portal, but especially for researchers in Sweden that arise in, in the early 2020 of the spring. I mean, there were several of the major funding bodies that were able to, in essence, uh, refurbish or change the, their present um, funding opportunities to actually all go into COVID-19 research because we know that there were hundreds of these COVID-19 related projects that started in, in 2020 and they have really contributed to this amazing amount of uh, research data and also publications. There are actually more than 3000 publications where at least one co-author was uh, working at a Swedish institute or uh, university that's been coming out these three years and that's that's a lot. Interesting to hear. We have a question from Tony Hay. Uh, hi there, Katarina. Yes. Um, at the SciLab Sci -Lab Life Lab data center, there are a lot of people who are called data stewards. What is, what is the sort of background of a data steward and, and, and what are the qualifications for that? I think it's a good term, but, uh, but I, I, I'd just be curious. Yes, um, I think that the, it's actually still under debate, you know, I think that the data steward is one of these reasonably new uh, positions and uh, there has been a lot of, uh, it, it's still not really clear um, exactly what, what credentials you have, uh, it really depends on, in my, in my uh, case, I'm um, originally a researcher. Uh, I did my PhD in, in pharmacology, and I have also quite a broad um, background in uh, pedagogics, uh, as a, both as a teacher and as a um, well, as an academic degree in pedagogics and communications uh, just a few years ago. So um, I think it really depends on some of my colleagues are more um, connected to computational sciences, I would say. Some are more really strong in life sciences. They have their own uh, background in, in research. Um, and uh, some of us are um, um, more, uh, I would say, directed towards, for example, discussions with policymakers. So it really depends on a little bit. I think mine is more data steward with communication. That's, that's what I'm working with at this point. So it really does depend. That's no, it, it, to me, it's, it's very interesting. I, I, I used to break up a data scientist as the data engineer who gets the data, the initial raw data, a data analyst to analyze it, and the data steward who is, is the person who makes sure that we can, it, it's fair and it can be accessed and, it, and it, it's, it's long life, has a long life. But yes. uh, so also... my, 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 my normal uh, thing is that I'm, of course, uh, the one who is meeting all the research groups and, of course, helping with them to, to share data uh, and also helping them to make data as fair as possible. Um, I think also Volmar did mention that we have a Silofleb data repository, which, which is actually like an instance of Figshare, which is uh, our national repository. Um, where I'm also uh, partially working. And that's also really an important part for all of the data stewards at the Silofla Data Center to be able to um, be working and also promoting this uh, repository. I think you were mentioning the repository, Volmar. 
I mentioned some repositories that we're yes. affiliated okay. with. And I, I mean, uh, elaborating a little bit on, on uh, Katarina's uh, response there, at NBIS we uh, don't have uh, the uh, employment title <laughs> data steward. Yeah. It's, it's a role within NBIS and we're employed as bioinformaticians. Uh, but uh, I mean, our advertisements for, for people that we recruit have, have been describing which projects that we intend for them to, to participate in and the role will be somewhere in the middle of, of the areas that you described, uh, Tony. Uh, so, I mean, someone who can speak the languages of infrastructure, research, and uh, I mean, uh, the, the other policy kind of related things and, and legal aspects. So being able to bridge uh, and, and uh, make sure that uh, things go smoothly from uh, the conception of the data where it's created to where it's then being shared. Yeah, because we should probably also mention that from the data center, traditionally we are, I mean, we're working with data management issues, yes, at the data center as a whole and all the IT, uh, and primarily helping out the infrastructure in comparison to NBIS because you are more uh, meeting the, the researchers. But that's really a little bit changed during the pandemic since we have became so embedded in these two research communities, the, the PLP research uh, program and this uh, data-driven life science uh, research program. And just wondered whether you see a role for research librarians. There used to be uh, uh, libraries used to have subject librarians, and and they're the people who should know about the metadata, who could talk to researchers. So, is there any involvement with the um, librarians doing research data management? Uh, well, first of all, I can say that one of my uh, colleagues, uh, she is. Um, a project lead for metadata and curation. That's one of my colleagues who is situated actually in Gothenburg because I'm in Uppsala. Um, but also we have a lot of research projects and, and very close collaborations with um, other people working as research uh, data management staff, for example, or the libraries. Uh, we are also really well connected to the you know, KTH, which is the uh, uh, Royal what is what is that in English, actually? Royal uh, School of Technology in, in Stockholm um, and their um, library. So those are among our closest collaborators, I think. Sweden is, in that sense, uh, reasonably small, so most of us know each other. Um, but I, I can say that, yes, for Data Center, we actually have the title Data Steward. We are, at the moment, four of us, and we are growing. So hopefully we'll be a whole Data Steward team just after the summer. There are two more coming in. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You. There is a question in the chat from Philip van der Heerde. Would you please present it? Uh, yeah, I can also say it out loud. So I was wondering, so the, the, the platform is really focusing on now emerging platforms, but does it also bring together historical data about past pandemics to learn from maybe for future? So because that historical data is available, but still largely scattered, I think. So it would be good if also that could fit in. Just the idea. That's an interesting topic uh, definitely i i do agree uh we have not at this point been discussing that actually but we're always happy for suggestions for from the research community so um um i, I will take that question with me to one of our meetings actually with uh, yeah, okay uh, because we don't have that at this point but um we are on the other hand if we're talking about um the COVID 19 data even uh, for example that uh, the swedish um which is actually collating a lot of the data on a national level, they're not going to be reporting a um, number of cases from now on. Uh, but we are still keeping this kind of data on the mm. portal. So connected to COVID-19, yes, we do have historical data, and that goes also for uh, wastewater, but not for, you know, like future, uh, no, present or, um, yeah, previous pandemics. We, we're more mm. looking to the future at this point, but we should definitely think about that. Thank you for that suggestion. Mm, my pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, we are now rapidly approaching uh, our next speaker in the program. Uh, please look in the chat because there are some information also published around uh, data stewards and uh, the role of a data steward. And uh, 
of course, uh, not only Uppsala, but also others are probably recruiting this kind of people. So if you have uh, interesting prospects uh, who would like a job like this, you can of course look at uh, ours, but also other universities um, and data centers who are looking for people in this area. Yeah. Uh, it's a developing career path uh, and uh, the area of research infrastructure is, of course, calling for new roles, but also data science is. Uh, and when with this uh, final comment, uh, I will move on to our next speaker, who is Roxana Wilk. Uh, she's currently affiliated with European Open Science Cloud, but also with the Academic Computer Center Cyphronet in Krakow. Uh, Roxana leads a research and development team which specializes in the delivery in the delivery of custom solutions for science and she's also involved in introducing open science related activities on European and Polish level uh, as a cyphron at open science affair representative. So please Roxana, I'm happy to have you here. Thank you, Margarita. I'm for, for, first of all, I'm very sorry for the circumstances around me. And I hope that it won't be bothering too much the noise around me. We hear all, you. I'm very it's grateful excellent. for asking. Great. Oh, the mm -hmm. headphones, good stuff then. <laughs> and I'm very grateful for uh, asking me to come here and present you with some other, I think, uh, point of view, because to start, and I will start sharing my screen. Um, what we have heard today was the marvelous point of view from the practical perspective of infrastructures which are all already thinking in the direction of open science and integrations either with each other or with EOSC especially. Uh, in my case, I would like to have another approach more connected to high level possibilities, what might be out there in the future for research, for science, for collaboration, for infrastructures that are supporting the research uh, and how we are trying to do so today and what might be the next steps uh, that have to be taken to get there. And uh, to start with, just let me, how to start the slides here, focus slide. Can you see my screen now? Yes. Good, thank you. Uh, so to start with, uh, I am a part of a big collaboration which is working on the infrastructure of uh, supporting infrastructure for EOS. And uh, by infrastructure, I mean many things because with infrastructure, we see the infrastructures which are connecting with the resources like computing, storage, data, metadata uh, databases and everything you can imagine that is helpful to create science nowadays but are also underlying infrastructure for the sake of these integrations exactly and this infrastructure the the core one we exactly are calling eos core platform and it cons consists of uh, many different sometimes strange services which in the end are meaning to uh, support the professional delivery of the tools for the sake of the researchers so the researchers don't have to worry about the technical stuff that they just can do their work in the most uh, pragmatic and uh, user-friendly manner as possible and the interesting fact is that what i have heard during your presentation so far uh, is and it's a good thing that all of these aspects that were mentioned are kind of in our center already so because when we are trying to understand what is needed in case uh, in the case of the infrastructure the core underlying infrastructure itself uh, what especially my team is doing is trying to understand the landscape connected with research in europe and with the landscape we have uh, we can mean many all of the scientific disciplines that are out there many different roles connected with science nowadays as data stewards exactly those to be honest were the last that we have got to know as uh, people that are very involved in the metadata curation and in open science in general 
and we tried to understand the first of all the needs of researchers and the possibilities that the current technology is giving us to make their life easier because in the end uh, what we would like to achieve and this is sorry so this is the platform this is the marketplace that is now the main entry point Sally has mentioned it uh, for the sake of discovery for the researchers but what we want in the end th the tools are not that important they are but they're only tools what we want in the end uh, to happen is allow the researcher at hand to find what is needed in terms of tools like uh, data, software, services, different kinds of them, use them together, combine them and use them together to reach the one research goal the researcher has in, in mind at the moment. Uh, and the different movements has been going for so long nowadays, uh, especially uh, local, uh, regionally or uh, thematically centered because we know uh, Sally here is representing the Raya. We had representation from a uh, physicist uh, world and uh, there are many, many other communities who are, that have already built the infrastructures needed for the sake um, of the work of researchers from their bubble, let's call it, that the researchers need. Uh, and it's already a huge step forward. The problem is what has Sally mentioned also that we need to remember exactly that what we are building in the end needs to be usable by the people who are not knowledgeable in those things we are because all we here gathered are probably most certainly uh, cap not capable but aware of the national European collaborations going on and capable of getting uh, resources needed for the research we have in our minds but it's not the case for every researcher out there and in the end what we want uh, probably somewhere in the future is that and that's the ideal world obviously but every researcher in Europe having the access to the tools that were delivered in the science especially with the public money because that's also the important case here because science and research is supposed to be public in the end and belong to everyone around us uh yes that's the same what i have already said so exactly the final goal is that uh, maybe one more thing before i follow uh, my personal belief is that what we are observing is uh, is this loop that science the develop development of the science is driving the technology but also the technology can driven the development of the science itself so we are here trying to understand what is needed for the techno uh, what is needed from the science uh, scientific perspective to make the science more effective especially for the researcher making the science happen and on the other hand the science uh, might be working on the technical developments needed for the sake of better evolution of the science itself so it's for me it's quite of quite interesting and in my personal view this is what we are trying to see now uh, to do now because understanding what researchers need we are trying to build a technology or connect the technologies out there with delivery of new uh, technologies to support the work of the researcher. So in the end, once uh, what uh, has been already made visible in EOSC uh, out there is the marketplace, which publishes different resources onboarded already by various providers across all Europe. And what has been done is, uh, well, I would say it was maybe not perfect, but we did uh, deliver some kind of a data model that let us uh, structure the kinds of uh, different kinds of resources we are getting from the providers and try to, in the end, have a uniform model that allows us to tell the researcher in the end what possibilities these are there um, across the different resources to use them together and in the end create an environment ready to support the whole problem the whole scientific problem i'm sure that every one of you knows that this is rather impossible right now either in the case of complex uh, complex scenarios complex use cases what we have already uh, seen and what is already out there are exactly the infrastructures ready 
uh, to support use cases from a given discipline. For example, Clarin is making a great example uh, out for me because I know Clarin uh, well, because they are always uh, willing to integrate with uh, the services we are delivering in EOS. And exactly, they are following the use cases, the new use cases that the researchers are bringing and uh, developing their infrastructure account accordingly. What we are trying to do for the sake of satisfying everyone, which is almost impossible, we are having quite the opposite approach. We are trying to understand the most general use cases out there. What is the meta science of science to plan and mm, deliver the architecture of the infrastructure ready to support everyone? Because this is the final goal the cross-disciplinary infrastructure, technical infrastructure ready to, ready to support the um, exchange of knowledge and results already achieved uh, by different groups of researchers in the Europe, in the world. And this is slightly different from what, uh, so rather horizontal than vertical. Uh, and the first uh, picture of the architecture, the EOS, for architecture as it is to make this possible is here. It's uh, maybe the most important thing is that we have this core technical platform that is about to deliver the providers, the core coordination functions and regarding the core coordination functions. So once we are delivering the service, of course, we know that we are not running the business or corporate world here so we don't have these high standards but in the end if we want something to happen it needs to uh, follow certain standards so for for the sake of these standards the core technical platform is allowing or is uh, enabling the functions of an AI infrastructure accounting for different kinds of services or uh, research products monitoring services uh, the catalogs the marketplace and order management for the, it's not order management per se, it's not only about ordering stuff, it's not the same as in the, I don't know, uh, not Allegro because of the Polish, eBay, it's not orders as in eBay, but it's rather access, resource, uh, requ access re uh, requests, sorry, uh, for the resources uh, made available by the providers to researchers. So these are the core coordination functions. On top, so every provider coming to the to EOS can either start using this uh, functionalities of the core platform or integrate their own if they already are doing things in a uniform manner for most or every of communities uh, out there, the development uh, level is very quite high. I would say that in some cases it's even higher than in our central one because the use cases are more specific. Uh, so for that cases, uh, there is a possibility to integrate, to, uh, to share and exchange the data about these functions between the core platform and the platform of the uh, onboarded or integrated provider. Uh, on top of that, we have horizontal services, which are the services meant uh, to be used for, by everyone out there. Like most, most of them are the infras, like computing and storage. Most of the scientists who are uh, experienced in using technology uh, in their work, they usually use the computing and storage infrastructure. But the next step is to make it available also for those who not necessarily need to know about technical details, just start using it as we are currently using things like Dropbox because it's easy and you don't, know, you don't need to know about the underlying infrastructure, uh, yes, infrastructure. The same applies or the same idea applies to horizontal services that first of all, they are supposed to be able to support any kinds of research, researcher out there. And secondly, uh, they are meant also for the integrations with technical, uh, sorry, with uh, thematical services to expand their capabilities. So for example, if someone is coming with a service uh, focusing on image processing and it's currently used for the processing of small images, but the service itself is ready to process bigger uh, bigger images and more complex use cases, the only thing that is lacking for the service is the underlying infrastructure, computing one. Uh, 
these horizontal services should serve for coming from EOS should, should be able to integrate with such thematical services coming from the outside, be integrated and used for the sake of such uh, services joining EOS. And exactly that case is shown here with different communities or clusters integrated to EOS. And the connection between the resor thematic resources and the horizontal services will be supported by the execution framework that should allow the thematic resources being deployed on the horizontal services available via EOS. And only as a matter of ter terminology, what we, how we call, call the coordinating functions is the EOS core, what we are making available for the researchers and what is, uh, yeah, it's a EOS exchange both of these platforms are supported with EOS support activities so it's about help desk it's about getting answer getting answers to questions raised by anyone in the scope of EOS and there is also the interoper interoperability framework that when it's finally ready when we know everything about everyone uh, we will be able to support the interoperability between most of the elements resources delivered via EOS. Uh, and about a little slightly more technical uh, element, when someone is coming to uh, EOS, some, uh, when some, by someone now I mean the provider, uh, we have the resource catalog where the provider is adding the new resources, which is also uh, at the later stage, passing the information about the resource to the marketplace and making it visible to the users of uh, resources. Uh, exactly, the provider is running uh, supporting services like help desk, service delivery, so order management part of it, um, accounting, monitoring, uh, AAI infrastructure on its own. Then the provider has the opportunity or possibility to uh, to integrate. And now regarding the obstacles here, um, I would say that main obstacle that we are facing right now or problem that we are facing right now that is that is the, yeah, I would say it's PR matter that not everyone believes that this thing may, makes sense, that EOS makes sense because on one hand, EOS is not offering that much to providers nowadays. At least that's what it seems. Uh, I believe other uh, other way, but that's kind of understandable because I work on the <laughs> development of it. So I would, if I didn't think so, that something would be strange. And because of that, uh, the capabilities that are being delivered are not uh, leaving its full potential. Because without the integrations between providers, infrastructures, or underlying platforms and the EOS platform, we are not getting the interoperability uh, as we wish. So that's one of the problems, uh, main one from the development perspective in EOS. And now I have a list of services available to the providers. I'm not sure if it's very interesting for you, to be honest but I put it for the sake of ref reference, uh, maybe I will just mention the, uh, one more time what is available for providers. And again, there are two main scenarios for the developed communities or providers joining EOS. Uh, there is this option to integrate the service, the coordinating services, core services with EOS services. For these providers who are coming, for example, with newly developed service but has no possibility to run help desk for it, EOS uh, can support in that part. Or the same applies to monitoring, the same applies to order management uh, and other services available. Research catalog, uh, sorry, <laughs> yeah, resource catalog, marketplace, uh, and I think that's the full list mostly relevant here. Regarding EOS monitoring, it uh, it supports five different uh, five different use cases. The central one, so this is when you use the core uh, core EOS core service monitoring as an infrastructure for the whole community. EOS can sorry deploy the whole monitoring infrastructure 
uh, for the whole community along with the along with the help for the probes needed to run this infrastructure uh, integration of external monitoring service so that's the case for uh, providers already running the monitoring service a uh, combined results of existing argo tenants uh, this is uh, something quite elaborate. This is when different infrastructures want to start crossing monitoring information between each other for the sake of collaboration. It's also available right now. And uh, totally honest, third party services exploiting EOS monitoring data. Ah, it's about uh, integration between, for example, marketplace and monitoring. That marketplace can now have the monitoring data on services. So it's not very relevant for the providers. Unless you are a provider, for example, of uh, uh, of the local marketplace or catalog, and you would like to have the, the data on the monitoring of EOS resources. With that, uh, with that case, with that use case, you can have that. There is a resource catalog and, uh, available with which you can use for the sake of onboarding uh, single resources or whole catalogs. Uh, there is also help desk exactly. Uh, three levels of inter interoperability in that case. So uh, going from the bottom direct usage. So uh, you can use the EOS helpless for the sake of handling your own tickets, the redirection. Uh, so the EOS helpless is only a proxy, then that creates a new ticket in a provider's help desk and full integration. Uh, it's using the um, API. What is and using the API only for the sake of creation creation of uh, new tickets in provider's help desk. What is not mentioned here is the, the possibility to instantiate EOS help desk uh, or a new version of it on the premises of the provider. We have accounting of research products. So if someone is running a repository, but with no function for accounting for metrics like uh, views or downloads, there is a possibility of uh, connecting the EOS accounting uh, infrastructure for the sake of counting these metrics or insta instantiate your own uh, infrastructure on your premises and do the same and then pass it to the central one. Uh, order ma and access management. So uh, it's quite similar to the previous uh, possibilities. So you, we are either, uh, Sombo is the internal part of uh, EOSC, so you can either start using the EOSC order management and uh, handle the tickets or and orders via our uh, UI for providers. Uh, in case you are running the order tickets or the access request tickets in Jira, there is very easy way to uh, integrate and have your own Jira tickets on your site via the Jira adapter that has been developed, or in case someone is running uh, their own order management system, there is an API that can be used for the sake of only exchange data between the marketplace and providers order management system. So the user using the marketplace channel will see all updates, all updates, including the messages uh, in the EOS marketplace UI and the provider sees all the updates in the provider's UI. Uh, and that is all on my slide. But what I wanted to mention regarding the uh, problems as we know it and relevant to what has been said earlier, and everybody has mentioned it, I believe, is the metadata. But I think that I have slightly different angle on the metadata issue. Uh, aligning the metadata structures in the scope of a single, maybe not even discipline, because even discipline can, can be very wide, but even one uh, scientific area is hard enough. It's much harder to find the middle between good metadata schema, so the user is able to use it for the sake of processing and analysis, and general and schema general enough for the sake of discoverability of a given data set or publication or whatever research output. From the discover, uh, discoverability aspect, there is also this problem that there is no mapping or alignment whatsoever 
in Europe, even in the elements that are relevant to everyone. Simple, uh, simple example. Once you uh, annotate the data set, many or everyone, every provider gives the information on the scientific discipline connected. But in one case, it will be called scientific discipline. In one case, it will be called discipline. In another, it will be called science. So in the end, as the hub of the data sets out there, it's hard to make a use out of it. So I would say the first obstacle uh, I see from the perspective of implementator of uh, infrastructure EOS European wide is the uh, overall coordination. And we know, and I'm not complaining here, I know how hard it is, but this is one of the things we need to crack, how to make people uh, work together, even in such small things, so we can make use out of them or translate or that, okay, because one thing is being able or ask is bottom down, uh, bottom up approach. So asking the providers themselves to curate the metadata on a certain level. And another is top down, of course, that we are, uh, as those who are getting all the metadata, uh, we are the ones working on uh, mapping, uh, polishing it, uh, updating it for a properly for the sake of researchers usability. But it's not working well. Uh, not even not uh, even because of the technical problems that's not the case but uh, reuse of such metadata further or updates in the metadata uh, those kinds of iterations needs to be aligned in the end if we want to have discoverability on the european and cross disciplinary level or at least that's what we think right now that this needs to better coordination and uh, fortunately or unfortunately better cooperation between researchers on european on european level working more like uh, open software uh, community for example working together on things but also being able to agree on things in a common ma manner that's one thing second thing about the metadata itself it's uh, also about the metadata standards, but uh, on the researchers end, so the proper quality of the metadata. So not even the structure, but the metadata itself. So once we as researchers are uh, adding a new data set because of our work, not everyone knows how to properly annotate it for the sake of, uh, for the sake of reuse of that data in the future. And this is on us, I believe this is on EOSC or any other uh, communities that are working uh, with uh, development of research as it is, because we need to teach. We need to teach people how to do it properly so it can be reused later, one, by other researchers for the sake of uh, reusability, but second, uh, from the perspective of uh, machine, uh, usability so this um, data can be uh, processed by the machine or by the services run on infrastructures that second thing and the last but not least uh, also regarding coordination for the metadata but now i lost it i'm sorry nope if i uh, remember then i will get back to you with it but there was one more quite important regarding the metadata coordination because without it uh, it's hard it's just hard to make oh i know what what i what had in mind for the very as the very last point is uh, i think that probably all of you know this already but the change of culture really because uh, we're not speaking that much of it but in the end eosp is about open science as well as well uh, but as we know open science does not necessarily work well for scientists uh, with regards to, you know, our, uh, our, let's say, career, scientific career. And this has to change slowly, both on the policy side and in our approach, our as the researchers, because what is very hard to do, even if you give the data, even if the data is very nicely annotated, people still tend not to give away the experiments 
they use to produce that data. And the data cannot be verified or unverified without the procedure itself that has been used uh, to produce them. So yeah, those three things I say, I would say are the biggest issues we are seeing right now. Of course, the same uh, applies more or less for the integrations themselves. So there are as many people as there are with as many hours as they are. So having focus on what we believe is important and putting our resources to it, like integrations in the European infrastructure, this is something that needs to be done all together. When a few will follow, the infrastructure will have no meaning and no sense for uh, at all, because without you, without providers, without communities, there is no infrastructure. But to do so, we need a probably clear vision, and that's on people with vision. Uh, and we need cooperation between the communities joining that vision. And I think that will be all from me. Uh, that's a very good. Uh insight to the practical work of, of uh, sharing and connecting data and uh, of course uh, it's also obvious uh, through these excellent presentations very interesting that this is very much work in progress not easy but uh, of course also some success stories uh, and uh, developments that can be used as uh, examples on best practice and so on uh now we would like to switch into the last part of this uh, workshop and um, it's time for a well, discussion or, or questions and answers and uh, some of these questions and answers we have already touched but um, before we go into I, I have some on my list but i'm sure that there are also other uh, people sitting here and thinking about uh, what about this and can you please tell me about uh, the things coming up uh, and, and also of course we are interested to hear about needs future needs uh, for services but I would start uh, with uh, addressing Professor Hay again who have a huge, I would say, experience for many, many years working in this area. And also, we haven't talked that much about, for instance, the industry or the private sector and the role of them in this, even though some of our areas, for instance, the life science area is, of course, very interested for the businesses and private, the private sector. Um, but yeah, no, I, I, it's, it's been interesting, and, and uh, um, my colleagues at the Rutherford Lab, where I work, uh, were initially involved in the the origins of EOSC uh, some years ago. Um, one of the things that does occur to me with the the whole context here is: has anybody explored the possibilities of using things like Chat GPT? This is yes. the <laughs> large language models, and you know. Uh, have people tried to, to to use to find data sets using chat gpt um, now i'm raising my hand i i have tried chat gpt not uh, particularly for you for finding data set but um, uh, more of uh, getting hold of uh, more broadly available information and since they have uh, as far as I know, uh, only uh, data up to two years ago or something, the most new uh, input and information is not there. So, uh, of course, a lot of interesting stuff is not available. Birgit is raising her hand. So actually, I was asking the same question in a recent session uh, with folks from Open Air. So, and they could not really answer uh, I mean, in the yes sense, but they are looking into um, translation of, you know, into queries. I mean, you're not Jet GPT, but if someone has a question input and then it's translated into a query of the database, I mean, but I hope they will take this from, I mean, if, if more people ask this question, then um, this will be taken more seriously because I, I think it's really, it's spoiling us in the sense of 
we know that we get a lot of garbage when we ask this question to uh, the chatbots if it's but sometimes it works quite well so i have been using this for example in the in the site so this citation um classification um service which is um not for free but uh, also combines this and the output looks looks quite promising in this uh, field so i look forward to a uh, nice user human inter interfaces if we skip it in the end it's like, I don't know, I mean, but more experimenting, please. <laughs> no, well, yeah, I, I'm also experimenting. I mean, yeah. my, Microsoft have a little known search engine called Bing. I must be the yeah, only yeah. poor version, right? <laughs> but 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 actually, instead of giving you a list of possible links to click on, it can give you answers, yeah. uh, which are much easier. But um, I, and there is in 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 other to to how how new it is. They've just announced a, a GPT four version, uh, which actually could contain more up to date information. But um, one of my concerns, actually two, two of my concerns. One is uh, these things are only possible to train these large language models because uh, they cost hundreds of millions of computing resources and only about four companies, the so-called hyperscaler companies like Facebook, Google, Amazon, and Microsoft have the have the resources to build data centers and compute centers and AI compute centers all around the world. And there's, there really isn't anybody in Europe who could do that, which is why I was always confused by the term, the European Open Science Cloud. It isn't a cloud, it's a collection of services. Yeah. It, and and it doesn't offer cloud services in the sense that the hyperscaler com companies do so my concern is that what i'd like to do is to have a go at training a large language model on uh data and 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 you don't know what it's trained on it's trained on trained by these companies and they choose whatever data they they, they choose i'm no longer with microsoft so i i can say that but what i'd like to be able to do is give academics and researchers around the world the possibility of training their own large language model on, on on information and data which is relevant to their topic for example uh, you could have um, a, a, an nlight version which could actually much more likely give you answers which were really highly relevant to to, to what you needed to know but you can't do that at the moment because it costs so much money so in america they have a thing called the uh the, they've just released a report on the national ai research resource which is an attempt uh, it isn't funded yet but they've agreed to go do it um, to provide ai computing resources which are competitive um, for researchers all over the us and and I, I don't know where we are in europe about providing we have an exascale initiative in europe but i don't know quite where we are about providing ai resources and i do think that's a real danger that academics will not be able to compete in research on AI topics relevant, for example, to all the things we've been discussing at this workshop. Uh, and and uh, I, I think this needs to be addressed. And uh, I don't know how we do it. It's really interesting perspectives because, uh, of course, we are representing universities that uh, have some kind of ambitions in, uh, of course, in science, but also in uh, uh, well, moving society forward and so on. Uh, and um, of course, it's important to have access to resources that are state of the art for what we intend to do. And um, uh, what you are uplifting here is really a challenge. And, and uh, I take it to the notes from this workshop. Yes. Yeah, so, so for example, I mean, Google's subsidiary called DeepMind, it's, it's in England, mm -hmm. they have solved one of the great grand challenges, you know, the protein structures, you know, know the protein, yeah. the different parts along the protein, but you don't know how it folds up with the chemical things, uh, attractions and forces and so on. But, but that's what they've solved, and they've solved it using deep learning with these large networks. Mm -hmm. involving computer resources that are way beyond what academics can do and mm -hmm. i really think that we are on the on the breakthrough of ai applied to science ai 
in the form of chat GPT, perhaps also applied to, to the things we've been talking about today. And I, I, I really do think there's a, an urgency for the UK and for Europe to address these needs. Yeah. You know, um, comments on that from the audience? Yeah, uh, well, there were some, all of them, but mar marvelous insights and very true and relevant. Regarding the chat and maybe the private sector versus, versus public sector, what Microsoft is not telling that proudly is how much money exactly, how much energy one search costs them. That's why they are not uh, exactly being, uh, that, that the next uh, plan is that Bing will start using chat GTP uh, technology. And this is how they want uh, to win with Google. And the predictions are that it might happen in fact with these functionalities, because in fact, some of the searches are great, but it's not very reliable because some of the searches on the other end are not very great. And for, from the scientific perspective, we can play with that, but I don't think that apart from discovery of publications or data sets, no one would rely on chat GTP, GTP outcome because it can even write code very well. We, we've done it in the team. We, we asked for some quite complex thing to, to, to be fixed by chat and it did it. Not not one hundred percent perfectly, but it did it. So it is kind of scary, but thrilling at the same time. But regarding also the private versus public sector, what saddens me really is that we cannot compete like with giants like Google or Amazon. And I know it might sound a little bit crazy, but I would be afraid that if chat GDP was in fact so good that uh, scientists can start using it for the sake of reliable science, I wouldn't be so sure to trust Microsoft with that data, like what might come out of it. I know it's a little bit silly, but in the end for them, it's all about money and you never know where money lies in the end. And uh, I think the science world has something else in the center. And what in my opinion also is troubling for us that there is not as, much money in the science as in huge companies so many people who would be great scientists will go elsewhere and that's totally understandable no no one can blame those people but what the problem is that in science there are many approaches ready to uh, pick up the same subject because on one hand we have ai which is great for uh, some areas but we have also quantum computational stuff coming arising as well, which is good for other stuff, more cryptology and so on. But maybe one day we will find a way to use it in other areas as well. So, and uh, summarizing, we have as many people as there are to develop such technology, to work on an AI infrastructure for the sake of science in Europe. But we have like finite number of scientists and they cannot develop at the same time all the technologies out there or scientific outcomes we, what we are pursuing currently. In Google or in Microsoft, they have three areas working on with thousands of people being paid with much money. So of course they will be better because they have money and they have resources. What I sometimes tend to believe we don't have or maybe, maybe, but that's just a hypothesis might uh, at, maybe not at value, but make more sufficient the, the science is coordination, like trying to, fo we are trying to do that, right? EC is telling us now there is money in the grants for AI, but it's not enough apparently because the AI is not as developed as it, it could be. So just a thought. <laughs> Thank you very much, Roxana. Uh, some of the issues coming up here is related to trust. And the, the, well, we have in a way to relate to the world outside universities and so on. And, and we also have a community of students that we are training and they will go out and work in these companies and so on. But one issue that is uh, very much uh, uh, well, debate and under and, and debate right now is also the, uh, well, the threat from disinformation. Uh, the COVID-19 platform raised uh, the importance of this uh, editorial board, uh, the area of health and uh, vaccines and so on uh, has been a major issue, issue in many 
countries uh, and um, it may be easy to to upload information i for instance tried this chat gpt and uh, some things that came out of it uh, wasn't uh, well when i checked it out uh, it uh, well it didn't make it up but but uh, i wouldn't trust it uh, do you have some uh, input on that issue how to handle uh, states providing disinformation, for instance, through this kind of services and how to make sure that it's really science that we are uh, talking about and, and not uh, activists or just invented data. Yeah. I think you'd never know really exactly, exactly, maybe not exactly my point, but without openness and transparency, how you deliver that data, you will never know. We know many cases of Things got, got published in Nature, for example, that in the end was were proven wrong, and not even wrong in terms of uh, the conclusions, but wrong like some, someone lied for the sake of better numbers and better statistics. So, uh, educate, educate, educate. I would say mm -hmm. educate people in yeah. recognizing mm -hmm. such things because there is no magical technology or algorithm that will allow us to say this is valid and this is not us at least for now at least it's important to actually be aware of the fact that even if you get something that sounds useful and see reasonable and a lot of a very well expressed uh, text and so on from chat gpt it, it may be not uh, well it's made up by, uh, of what it's available to it and it could be anything Maybe. Um, you might have... be interested in knowing what Chat GPT says about Enlight, right? It says not the much, Enlight... I would say. The Enlight project is an EU funded project that aims to exploit, wait for it, the full potential of LED lighting through breakthrough innovations in integrated lighting solutions beyond better fit applications. This includes intelligent lighting systems. So I don't think it's uh, quite there yet. I wouldn't trust it. No, it's not you there yet. That's... Was before. So when you Google, you will likely find a project which is of this name. But of course, it could be made up completely. Yeah. And and, and light was, if, if, if you think about uh, the time available uh, to, to the chat GPT, the, the most recent information is not there, then uh, it would probably not find much about Enlight because it wasn't there in 2021. So uh, if it find anything, it's just something about a project about to start and so on. So uh, that's also well, some kind of critical thinking. Birgit is, has her hand. Yeah, well, I mean, as um, we had to education mentioned quite a few times, I'm I'm still wondering on how we move forward on this because it's um, quite a struggle to get um, these topics into higher education curricula. So <laughs> even though there is quite a few materials out there produced by librarians, researchers, and so on, I mean, I don't think that. Um, so easy because as there will always is pushback in the sense of uh, we are so fully packed with what we teach uh, students already and uh, there's no room for this and then you meet people that they have discovered meta data so late in life and then you have all these yeah issues with infrastructure that they never hear about infrastructures during their whole education <laughs> apart from this, this stuff out there in terms of dropbox and so on i mean this this um mix and match and everyone does it's this stuff on its own any comments <laughs> how we could uh, join up forces here better comments oh. on that Great. i would have a small comment on chat uh, on the chat gpt thing again um when it comes to teaching and you know the students have to submit their 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 thesis and whatnot and um, we have to deal with these theses now not knowing who wrote them. Um, I started already searching for these uh, chat GPT text detectors. You know, I, I share here a link. I do not know if you can 
access it, but um, when you add a text in that box, um, he gives you um, a probability like um, how realistic is it that a human has written a text or even a machine, you know. And I tried this, I made a trial and uh, it was uh, surprisingly good, this outcome. So this gives me a yeah. little bit of hope that I could, you know, like uh, test some of the papers I will be receiving um, and to see, okay, um, has the student written this? And this, of course, uh, also influences the teaching. Um, we want to teach them how to, how to, you know, do good science, so to say, and how to cite in a right way and all these things and at the same time struggling now with the fact that we do not know um has this person really written the text and it's difficult yeah indeed thank you uh i'm thinking about i'm back in this uh well how to build this new world uh, based on data and get access to resources and so on. We have talked a lot about European Open Science Cloud, but there is another initiative in Europe called Gaia X. Uh, is there anyone who has some kind of experience on that? No? I think it's uh, more or less something that Germany and France uh, took initiative to, but uh, as far as I know, it's more, um, well, business oriented than the European Open Science Cloud, but I may be wrong. Um, let's see, I wrote down some other topics to discuss as well. Um, We have been into the student perspective uh, here and uh, uh, some uh, thoughts about how to make them more uh, well aware of uh, these changes and uh, how to make them more uh, uh, prepared for the future of uh, a lot of open data and so on in the world. Uh, but I think that uh, Merle, for instance, also touched issues uh, of relevance for, for instance, the teaching community uh, and the need of upskilling in order to have people who can actually guide the students. And anyone who have thinking about the uh, community as in light, for instance, when we are now, uh, we are moving into the next funding period and we are thought, thinking about uh, activities and, and things to do to prepare, to, to prepare uh, our future communities. Uh, if you have thoughts or, or ideas about services or functions or needs, uh, AI chats for infrastructures or something like that that might be useful in actually in this new ecosystem needs that could facilitate. There's a comment in the chat. Yes. It's Katarina. Mm. Uh, I just, just wanted to, to mention that if that was of interest to some of you, that actually there is a <clears throat> new initiative for a training hub mm. from Sidelife Lab that was just launched, uh, I think, in February, and they're still um, building on this. And that may be of interest when it's mm. started to grow a little bit more. I think that in some cases it may be a good strategy to use what the uh, well, we have had that kind of discussion within the light. We were supposed to make mappings and so on. And you can have lists with thousands of code makers and uh, people who are professors in AI and so on. But these things are changing all the time. And we have service providers like this Silect Lab platform or, or other platforms, science cases or, or infrastructures like Daria that are 
actually providing training modules or, or have uh, startup kits or, or um, something you can put in the hand and, and actually get good information about how to get started and maybe universities uh, can benefit from uh, that kind of collaborations rather than setting up their own modules. Yes, could, could I make a, another, another comment on AI methods? I mean, uh, ChatGPT is, is the latest thing. It's these large language models with huge amounts of data and huge amounts of compute. But there are things that um, actually will revolutionize the way we do science. Uh, and I usually call it AI for science. And um, this is an advert, so you please ignore it. If you, There's a book coming out with some colleagues of mine called AI for Science, which collects about 38 different examples coming from all sorts of science, from physics to biology to uh, to whatever, and just give short essays which are readable about what they think will happen when AI applications like deep learning are applied to their data sets. And so one of the things I'm doing at the Rutherford Lab is there we have these big machines like synchrotrons and neutron sources which produce now very large data sets that you can't take away with you on a USB. So the scientist has to figure out how to take back large sums of data, many terabytes of data back to their university to analyze and so on. Mm -hmm. But we've been working with them and uh, this is much more manageable. You can provide the, the AI resources to use AI algorithms on, on this scale of data. And uh, one of the things we're doing is, is, is this, science benchmarks machine learning science benchmarks so you can have the open code the open data and you can actually go and run the results and see if you can do better with a different algorithm or a, a, a different type of computer so those are the things we're trying to do which are more accessible to scientists across europe um, uh, but uh, i think there will be quite a lot of activity there certainly will be a lot of activity around things like chat gpt mm -hmm. uh, and it's obviously got a long way to go but nonetheless i think it, it should not be ignored by the the academic community mm -hmm. and, and there are some estimates about how much computing it's been used uh, and they're very large numbers but i don't think there's anything official from microsoft but um it does use a huge amount of computing but the computing mm -hmm. that we use uh, at the lab is is you know instead of many hundreds of thousands of, of gpu processes to do the training we only have you know about say hundreds or thousands of processes and that i think is achievable on on a university type scale mm -hmm. but i think it these type of ai applications machine learning on these big data sets will make a huge difference to the way we do science on data sets but also the the machine learning and ai techniques will be used in the whole pipeline from taking the data before you get to a data set, the ways will optimize. And I think there'll be a, a, a real radical transformation. And if you look at things like the, the NSF site, they, yeah. uh, they, they believe that they're going to transform the way much of science is done in the future. That's a really good closing remark, I would say, because we are of course also very interested in more like not only this uh, societal uh, issues, but uh, of course also uh, what can be done in, in other more experimental uh, areas where there are of course it's tremendous amount of data and you, you have to be, well, this make some kind of a qualification of it. You need data stewards to manage the data, to make sure the metadata is there, to make sure some way we've gone to get fair. So I actually do believe in library. I believe the future of libraries is in research data management, working with scientists uh, and a data steward type role. So uh, otherwise, I, I see libraries will just be coffee shops where you can go and connect with Wi-Fi. And I, since I care about libraries, I'd like libraries to be central to the institution of a university, to be the guardian of the intellectual output of the university, which, which is involving data nowadays. Open science involves not just the open access to papers, but also, as you all know, to, to the data sets and making them open is important. 
Thank you very much. Also very important when we nowadays are arguing about the costs of the libraries uh, and it's uh, sometimes related to this that students go there and take a cup of coffee, but there is of course uh, a lot of other important things that libraries provide in, in an intellectual community. Um, we are now at the end of this session. And uh, I would like to thank you all for interesting speaks, uh, talks uh, and good presentations and also very important and initiated discussions. Uh, we are now hungry, I think. So thank you very much and uh, uh, prosperous data future to you all, I hope. Thank you, Margareta. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.